For reasons I do not understand, the video did not work this last Sunday, so this is obviously a uh, re-preach of the story of Zacchaeus, which is a shame I have to re-preach it because um, it was a lot of fun in person and there was a lot of fun uh, interaction with the people here. But I think it's worth, uh, it's a, worth a story worth telling again. The way that the story of Zacchaeus is often told is that uh, it's a focus on this short dude who uh, pays attention to Jesus and it's excited, excitement because Jesus is paying attention to someone and isn't it funny he, he's in a tree. That is how it's commonly told, as sort of a VBS story and it goes with, along with the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And uh, while learning Greek, a, my professor took uh, some joy in pointing out that the grammar of, of the New Testament talks about how he was short and so Zacchaeus climbed a tree that the he there, that pronoun, could refer both to Zacchaeus or could refer to Jesus, which again, uh, it's, it's an interesting twist. Maybe Zacchaeus was six foot long, uh, tall and uh, Jesus was four foot tall. We don't know. But again, the focus there would be on, there's a short dude. Isn't that funny? The story of Zacchaeus came up in conversation with a friend of mine named Dave a few years ago, and he started asking about it, and he started taking the story seriously. What would happen if this really went down, how it's described? What would the impact be? And it got me to thinking that this was far more than just a short story about a short person. And so we're going to tell this story again. Luke tells the story of Jesus. He's always aware of the geography. And so when Luke tells the story of Zacchaeus, we know that they're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is always on his way to Jerusalem. And Jericho, where uh, Zacchaeus and Jesus meet, is the last big city on the way to Jerusalem. It's a really large trading city. And what happens in this moment is, is right before, if you turn the page, in one direction, you find the triumphal entry when Jesus gets to Jerusalem in the beginning of Holy Week. And if you go a page back, we find Jesus with one of, uh, with a failure, an interesting failure. A page back, we find in Luke 18, the rich young man, the story of the rich young man, the guy who comes up to Jesus and says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Like, what do I have to do to get the benefit of being part of this family? What must I do to have this life that's transformed, to be a, a child of Abraham? He is told that what you have to do is to follow, Jesus says, follow the law, you know, the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God and um, honor your mother and father and uh, don't covet the, your neighbor's stuff and, and don't lie. I mean, this is, this is what you should have to do. And the guy responds, no, 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 I've got that. What, what else do I have to do? And, and Jesus tells him, well, you're going to have to let go of that thing that's holding you back, this, this treasure. And he walks away. This guy says no to Jesus. It's a fascinating moment. Someone just says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, Jesus. And he takes a walk. And it's, some, it's this amazing moment. It's because, because it's this moment when the guy who has everything going for him, this... Uh, pillar of the community, respected, amazing fellow, like everyone knows him, educated, everything going for him, pillar of the community type of guy, comes to Jesus, and if anyone you expect to be able to follow Jesus and to inherit eternal life, to get Jesus' approval, this is it. This is the guy. And it doesn't happen. And then this happens, right? We come up to Zacchaeus. And while it's amusing to imagine someone climbing a tree to see Jesus, we need to stop and take a minute to understand the difference between the rich young ruler who could just walk up to Jesus and Zacchaeus, who has to climb a tree to get Jesus' attention. Because what does it take such that people were just not going to let him through? You see, Zacchaeus was despised. 
Zacchaeus was hated. Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector, which means he is so despised that though people had to respect his authority, people like lock ranks against him. They can't, I can't actively challenge you, but I can get close enough to my neighbor so that no matter how you try to get through, we're all just going to shuffle one way or the other so that you aren't going to get through and get what you want. You won't be able to blame any one of us and take it out against us. You just aren't going to go here. And uh, so he has to climb a tree because he is so despised. Well, why is he despised? It has to do with the tax system. Taxes are never popular, but they were particularly ugly in Rome, the Roman Empire. Here's how it worked. The Roman Empire would look at one area and they'd say, we need to collect so many dollars from this area. And people would bid to be able to collect that money. And then they would have local people bid to be able to collect that, that portion of what was owed. And so what that would mean here in Missouri, as far as if I can read uh, Wikipedia correctly, uh, the state of Missouri sends in $64 billion of federal tax money a year, people in Missouri. And that breaks down to an average of $10,551 in 2015 dollars. Uh, per each Missouri resident. And so what would happen is one person would bid to be able to have the rights to collect money for the state. And so one person would say, you know, I'll bid three, three million. Now I'll bid five million. Someone else would swing in and say, you know, I'm gonna bid, I'll bid 15 million. Now I will give you the Roman Empire or the federal government $15 million to be able to collect all the federal taxes for the state of Missouri. So, uh, Okay, now the state, uh, the federal government has made a chunk of money on top of the federal taxes that come in. How does the person who's bid make the money? Well, that person who has bid to have the right to collect the federal taxes now goes to each county and finds people, local people, who want to collect taxes. And they each bid. And so they would bid, you know what, I'll, shall buy in a county, right? Someone will say, you know, I'll bid three. $3,000 to collect the taxes here. And someone else say, well, I'll bid $20,000. I'll bid $30,000. Right? They'd bid some certain amount and they would win the right to collect the taxes for that county. And so the guy who has bid and gotten the right to collect taxes for the entire state, that's how he or she makes their money. They make, they make their money on, on what the local people pay, what the local people bid to be able to collect the taxes. So how does the person here in the county make the money? The person here in the county would know that he needs, or she needs, 10 and a half grand per person. That's what the average payout per person in Missouri in federal taxes. So they would go up to someone's door and they knock on the door and they would say, it's a good looking garage you got there. I think I need you to pay 13 grand in taxes. Oh, you don't have the money? Shame if something would happen to that garage. You sure you don't want to pay? And then they would pay that 13 grand. They had the, the local person had the full weight, power, and authority of the Roman Empire and Roman legions uh, behind him or her. And, um, and so the person would pay the 13 grand, but the person who collected it only had to hand over 10 and a half grand. And so they would put two and a half grand in their pocket. And that's how the local person made their money. But the thing is, that local person, it's the local person who had to collect the taxes because it's the local person who, knew ha who, had, who has the money. And so the local person is someone who has sold their soul to the Roman Empire, has sold their soul to the government to sort of turn in their neighbors. A traitor, like a tax collector, is like a local traitor. It's a, like a mob extortionist IRS combination that is just hard to imagine. I can't imagine a modern comparison to the tax collector of Roman times. It was a great system for extracting money, but it was not a system that built up trust. And so the local tax collectors are despised because they are the, the local people who are traitors to their people. And then the Zacchaeus, he is a chief tax collector, which means he's been at it for a while. And so he's the guy everyone hates, not only because he is, extort he is extorting and taking money, but because he is tempting your children to sell their souls to the Roman Empire. 
Like Zacchaeus is despised. He is hated. And so Zacchaeus is outcast and he wants to meet Jesus. And he knows that Jesus will talk to tax collectors because it's back in Luke 5, we see that Jesus calls a tax collector, Levi, calling him out of his tax booth to come follow him. And Levi follows him. He leaves behind. It's an interesting comment upon the life of a tax collector. You have as much money as you can gather, but the Levi leaves it leaves it all behind to follow Jesus. That's a comment upon the nature of the tax collecting trade. It's lonely. Right? And so he, Jesus then has this dinner party and he invites Levi and all of Levi's tax collector friends and people start murmuring. Why, why is he with these folks? These are not right. This, these are not good people. And Jesus responds to the murmuring saying he came for the sick, not the healthy. And then further on, and it's in Luke 7, uh, Jesus welcomes all people to gather to him, and that includes a bunch of tax collectors. And again, people are murmuring. And so here we are at the apex of sort of Jesus' ministry. He's a, at the height of his popularity, at the pop height of his of being known in, 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 across the nation of the kingdom of Israel. As he's about to hit Jerusalem, it's about to be the apex of his life as the events of Holy Week are coming. And he comes into contact with Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus knows Jesus' history and he wants to make a change. And we don't know exactly why. What we know is that an older fellow, you don't get to be a chief tax collector overnight. Someone with this, so the equivalent of like a, a, a older banker, right? This is, Zacchaeus is like an older banker type fellow. He'd be wearing the, the first century equivalent of the three-piece suit with the, the, the vest and everything dry cleaned. And, right, what would it take? How desperate would, it, would you have to be to climb a tree if you're 50 years old and wearing a three-piece suit? Like, how desperate do you have to be? Like, that, that's where Zacchaeus is at. He is just desperate. I mean, is he tired of being tired? Is he just stuck and he doesn't know what to do? Is he looking back at his life and realizing that he has gone down a path and he can't get free from it and he's stuck because everyone sees him a certain way correctly? That I mean, he has done horrible things, right? And so he is so desperate that he climbs a tree. And we don't know why exactly, but we know that Jesus looks at him and says, Come on down, we need to have a meal together. And Zacchaeus, this Jew who works the Romans, who lives among the Jews who hate him, because they hate Rome, right? When was the last time do you think he's been invited to dinner? When was the last time he's been invited to sit down with folks and just talk? Because what happens if you talk to the tax collector? If you mention, you know, the crops are going in this year, then the tax collector will know who to hit up for more money. Now, you can't talk around the tax collector because he might come after you. You can't let him know anything. And so Zacchaeus, who's just been offered a place at the table, friends to break bread with the first time in memory, he accepts this invitation and he responds. Right? He responds and he says, Lord, half of my wealth I will give to those who are poor, and I will get even with, with anyone I've wronged up to four times over. And he says this, not just like by himself, not later on with, with Jesus alone or Jesus and the disciples. He says this right away, surrounded by the community that he has hurt. Like this it is an amazing reaction. It has, if you think about the crowd's reaction at this point, this is amazing. Right? This is a moment when someone turns to Jesus and it changes their lives. And it's not the person you expect. In the last chapter, remember, we had the rich young ruler who had everything going for him. He's the one you expect to get it right. And he walks away, and the crowd must have been very confused. Well, now the crowd is very, uh, this, a different crowd is very confused for a completely different reason, because they never saw this coming. They never saw Zacchaeus being the one who would turn to Jesus and, and then repent. Right? Turn. Uh, repent means turn. Right? He turns to Jesus, returns to how Jesus does things, and he gives an apology that has some teeth to it. 
All right, this is an apology that has some real weight. This is not like mistakes were made, Jesus, and I'm sorry the tax collecting system is wrong. This isn't Zacchaeus saying, you know what, I'll clean this up going forward. I'll try to figure out how to clean it up in the future. No, Zacchaeus owns it. He says, I will go back. And if I'm not square with you, I'll get it right. You come to me and we will get fixed. We'll get even. We will work it out how it ought to have been. I can't make it as it should have been, but I can do my best right now. He is going above and beyond. In the Old Testament, the requirements around getting square with someone when you've wronged them is if you've unintentionally wronged them, you give them 100% plus a fifth. You give them 120% of value. If you intended to do wrong, you'd give them two times over. If you stole a cow, you'd give back two cows to get even. Zacchaeus is going above and beyond that, four times over. Like Zacchaeus gives an apology with weight, with some meaning to it. This is really impressive. All right. He says, I know I was wrong, and I am now going to accept Jesus' call to follow, and he does what he can to make it right, and the whole gathered community would just have been shocked. And what does Jesus say? In response, what Jesus says is, Today salvation has come to this house, for he too is a son of Abraham. Right? The thing that the rich young man wanted, to be a son of Abraham, to be part of the family, he doesn't get. Because he clings to what he's, he's holding on to. And Zacchaeus, he gets it. He is declared a son of Abraham. He is declared as being saved and being healed. He, he is not going to need to fear the judgment and it's not just this individual moment of salvation either. It is the healing both of Zacchaeus, who has been alone, lonely, and lost for so long. He now has people to gather around him and embrace him. But it is also the healing of a community. Because if you think about what, what would it be like to be part of a community where the money started to flow back in and people could start to pay for their kids to go to the doctor again. Where money would flow back in, where people could risk starting some businesses because they had a little bit of capital in their pocket. Where money would flow back in and, and people could pay to repair their houses or, or plant a little bit more of a crop. Like, what a difference it would make. And more, even more profoundly, maybe, to be able to trust the people in authority. To be able to trust the, that the person collecting the taxes is not trying to pull one over on you. Man. That would be such a gift. This is not just the healing of one person. It is the healing of a person and the community that he is part of. Right? We know that sin isolates people and warps community. And in this moment, as Zacchaeus turns away from sin, he is welcomed back into community. And it starts to heal, heal that community he is part of. Zacchaeus is this amazing story. I don't believe it's a short story to gloss over. I think in doing so, we, we shortchange it, right? I think uh, Zacchaeus is a story of the most expect, unexpected being welcome, uh, and how when we embrace the lonely and the lost, that brings healing not just to the, the people who are lost, but also brings healing to the community that they are part of. Salvation came that day when Zacchaeus climbed a tree, and we see that salvation is both an individual and a communal impact. Salvation of the person heals the family that he or she is part of. And it is the same salvation that we still see offered today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.